Chance for future question mark. Your stage, your talk. Here we go. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay, this is uh, not just my talk. This talk has a history. I have a co-author. Uh, Martin Dernkembo is a colleague of mine who could not come here, but uh, so I will give this talk by myself, but we worked together over the year uh, on this talk because uh, this talk has a history. Uh, it's, and it's a bit of the history of Scientists for Future, which is an association of uh, scientists that evolved this year basically um, uh, with the movement of the students and pupil, uh, pupil of uh, Fridays for Future. Uh, and they were questioned, you know, that uh, they took to the street and said, hey, we want a future, we want that things change, uh, and they demanded for politics to change. And this did not directly happen, but it was questioned, so some, uh, well, professional politicians said, well, they should leave it to the professionals. And that's the point where actually a lot of scientists, and a lot of scientists I know, all, where they were all really mad at this, because they've been doing science and research for so many years. And we've been, I mean, I don't know if you saw the presentations before, uh, and how much effort is being put into this, uh, into this research to make it better and better, better models. And what I, I, I will show you, the pre, uh, this presentation is about the results of the outcome of this and what this means. And still nothing changes. So they write papers, they write reports, and, well, nothing happens. And so the only thing we could say was basically, hey, they are right. Things need to change. And that's why we got together and formed this association. So they, uh, there's a charter on this uh, uh, which says basically what we do is we go out and we try to inform people on the research, on the state of the art of the research, and how things are currently. And that's why I'm here. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. So we go out to wherever, uh, and you can come to us and ask for, uh, for presentations, for discussions, uh, to get informed on this topic, on what does this uh, uh, climate change issue actually mean. And I, uh, this is the disclaimer now, uh, I can tell you uh, this is not a good mood talk, okay? So this, uh, yeah, this is a bit, uh, because the topic is very serious. So uh, it's a bit different than I usually do it, so in the end it will look a little bit better than in the beginning, but nevertheless. So where are we currently? So this is the current graph. Uh, it's also from the, uh, and I will, this is all not research by myself, this is mainly from IPCC reports, and this is from the report from last year on the 1.5 degree uh, report, which was basically done or uh, put together because uh, in the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015, it was said, well, we, uh, the world or the, the, the governments of the world want to keep the, uh, the climate change to uh, the temperature change to well below 2 degrees, if possible, to 1.5 degrees. And the question was, hey, is this actually possible? Can we make that? What do we need to do to do this? And so there have been, has been a lot of quest, uh, questions about this, and a lot of research, a huge number of publications came out on this topic. Hey, what does it mean? to have a 1.5 degrees warmer Earth? What does it mean to have a two, 2 degrees warmer Earth? And uh, is this actually possible to limit climate change uh, to these temperatures? And this is the current state, so this is... Um, I, I really love this graph because it ha contains a lot of different things. So what we're talking about, so we have a pre-industrial period that we use as a reference. So that's the period from, 19, uh, from 1850 to 1900 here. This is the reference period where we say, okay, this was pre-industrial temperature, and everything afterwards, the changes from that are, are all referring to this. So 1.5 degrees or so would be the difference from, uh, from this period. And uh, then climate, what climate does, it's not always constant, so uh, every year you have, sometimes it's a bit warmer and sometimes a bit colder, so what you need to do is you need to average. Uh, this is quite important because then, uh, for example, in, there is this year of, uh, where is it here, 1998, 
there was a very warm year, and after, afterwards, a lot of, for a long period, there weren't so many warm, warm years, and then there were some people saying, oh, yeah, look, the temperature does not change anymore, so everything's fine now. And this is, of course, not true, because you have to look at average periods. So the red line, this is the uh, so-called floating average, so you always average with the years, and this gives us about the current temperature change. And uh, so this would be like a typical climate, uh, climate period, which is like 20 years. You usually look at 20 years. But the problem we have currently is that the change is so drastic that looking for 20 years, then you would always have to go far back to periods when well, there, there, would, the, the, there was a big difference to today. So uh, the last changes uh, in this report were taken from this 2006 to 2015 period. And the extrapolation from this was basically that uh, in 2017, we probably reached a one degree increase in temperature uh, on a global scale. This is not always in the, the same in different uh, areas. It might be warmer and different. It's, it's colder, but that's the global increase. So, um, so this is where we are currently. Um, so we have an increase from 280 parts per million in CO2 to about 410. Uh, this is uh, changing. Uh, this is not constant, but it's a bit going up and down. But it's about 410 in 2019. Uh, we have a strong increase in temperature uh, globally, but the biggest increase uh, is actually in the winter. It's in the Arctic. Um, uh, and there's current anthropogenic uh, surplus is about 40 gigatons per year. Um, so 40 gigatons, is, was that, that was actually current, that was this already gone, because we're now a bit higher than that, but uh, uh, this was uh, the average period for, from 2011 to 2017. Okay, now uh, I go directly into this IPCC report from last year, this 2018. Uh, in chapter two, there's this table. Uh, I love this table. This table contains a lot of climate science because uh, it goes into um, how much actually uh, can we further emit to reach which temperature change. So this would be here the 1.5 degrees Celsius. This would be the 2 degrees Celsius. And then you have uh, probabilities. How likely you can avoid this or is it going to come? So if you want to avoid with a two sigma, uh, that is uh, like a 67% uh, probability uh, to go over 1.5 degrees, we have 420 part, uh, gigatons to emit further additionally into the atmosphere. 420, as you remember, it's four, uh, 40 gigatons per year. And this was, uh, I think this was since this is from last year, uh, from no, so the, this refers to 2000, basically 2017. So this already two years gone since then, and it has not decreased, but but increased actually. And then there's a lot of different. You know, if you go for a 50% chance, you can we can say say okay, it's a bit more we can emit. And if you go, with, well, we just want to have a one third chance, then we actually would have double uh, the amount we could emit. For two degrees Celsius, this is far more, so it's more than 1,000 uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalents to emit. Now, um, there are, of course, a lot of uncertainties, all kinds of uncertainties that go with that. And uh, one is, for example, the so-called Earth, Earth, Earth system feedback. Um, that is, the Earth itself responds to this emission and uh, also emits uh, CO2 and, or also methane, and uh, this has an Im also a long-term impact. And then there are further uh, uncertainties, and these are, I mean, this uh, has been also part in the uh, uh, previous talks that, of course, climate models do have uncertainties. Nevertheless, if we take this into account and say, okay, we want to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperature with a two-thirds probability. So that, that's, they call this likely in this report. So it's likely that we are not exceeding 1.5 degrees. We have 420 gigaton surplus CO2 to emit into the atmosphere in total. 
100 gigatons will be more or less gobbled up by the Earth response. This is actually, this was in the report. Uh, current research shows that this is likely a bit too conservative, so it's probably more, but, um, well. Okay, uh, so the, our emission is about 40 gigatons. So the implant, uh, CO2 emissions by coal power plants that are running was at the point, at that period, 200 gigatons CO2. So they are built, they are running, 200 gigatons by that. And then we have 100 to 150 further gigatons for planned coal power plants or those under construction. If we count this together, we have already exceeded the 420 gigatons CO2. And this is, of course, one reason why these coal power plants have to be shut down. But they are, of course, not the only source. They are only one source of CO2 emissions we have in the atmosphere. And to make this clear what this means, and this is what, what I go into this now, what does this mean, this 1.5 degree difference um, to 2 degree? And there's been a lot of research on that, okay? Um, now, the first one is, for example, uh, first example is here on the Arctic. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of talks about ice bears and so on, but uh, of course, this is not the only thing to care about. It is quite crucial um, that there is ice there, also because the ice, we had this before in the pre previous talks, that the ice reflects the sun, and the less there this reflection is there, the more warmth is being taken up by the Earth again, so we have a, like a feedback system there. Also, of course, because of all the, uh, it's not just the ice bear, there's like a whole bio biosphere there, and this biosphere has to somehow survive. Now, the likeliness of an ice-free Arctic is this graph here, uh, of the, the comparing 1.5 degrees, this is this one, or these two studies, these are two studies here, one with a dotted line and one with a full line, and two degrees. And this is how likely is this in a certain period of time that this happens. And so you can see, if we consider again that it's, that it's likely, it's about 45 years it takes for at a 1.5 degree Celsius increase that we have an ice-free Arctic. So this is actually possible with this increase, but it's like once every 45 years. If we go for a two degree increase, this is once every 10, or even with the other study, it's more like once every five years that this is happening. And this is quite frequent, and this, of course, causes quite some impact on every, everything that lives there. Now, this is ice and Arctic, and there's not so many people living in the Arctic, so there's a lot of further studies that have been done. And uh, this, for example, for Africa, I will only we, because of limited of time, I can do this talk for many hours, actually. Uh, uh, I will only go on to this example here. Extreme heat with record temperatures over close to 50 degrees and actually even increasing that. Um, that has been there in 2009, 2010, in the, uh, in the uh, month from December to February uh, in Africa. And these are temperatures where people cannot be outside anymore at these temperatures. It's just too hot. And then I have, the, it's showing these curves, and these are probability density functions. So these curves show how often like, each of these Balkans, I, I don't know, bobs here are showing how often does this happen. And so here we have current, that the current status is the, the temperature from 2006 to 2015, that's what they call current, so there is already this increase uh, in temperature. Under these conditions, this happens every, well, maybe twice every 100 years. If we go for 1.5 degrees increase, that's the blue line, we can see this is going to happen every more or less third year. If we go for two degrees, this is going to happen even more often. So uh, this is, for people living there, it, it's getting hard to live there. It's just, just the temperature, only, only that. 
if we go for, for example, for Australia as an example, uh, there we have the same, it's, it's always these, these curves here, uh, extreme warm temperatures, uh, well, that's very easy. But in Australia, what's also important there, it's, um, it's the temperature of the water because of the, um, uh, the, the corals that live there. And hot water leads to coral bleaching, so basically the corals die. And um, this is, all, of course, as you've seen, the, the temperature is not always every year the same, but there was uh, this hot summer and an extreme coral bleaching here, temperatures uh, situation here in the summer in 2012-2013. And um, how often does this happen? And we can already see here, this would be the natural, so this would be the pre-industrial curve here, where this very warm temperatures hardly ever happen. Well, we can see here already, this would be every third year currently, would be every second year in 1.5 degree scenario, and probably two or three years in a two degree scenario. And this, well, what this means, I will go on to this later. This is an example for Europe, uh, well, how often things happen. Uh, I don't know if you... I, I always remember that, that one because I, uh, I uh, well, it was a lot outside during that period. That was a very warm summer we had in 2003, and a lot of people died of that because of the heat. And I remember being in Cologne at the time and uh, laying outside at 40 degrees, uh, uh, and I was ill, and so I had 40 degrees, so outside was 40 degrees, was very warm. And so naturally, this, would, could be, this can happen, it could happen, uh, like once every 100 years. Currently, we have like a situation where this would be like every fourth year, and this increases then to uh, more than 59% of all the years with two degrees Celsius. So we're going to get hot summers. This is the prediction of this study here. Well, what does this mean? Um, well, and now I go back to the IPCC reports, and the IPCC reports are very diplomatic always. Uh, and so they, uh, they have reasons for concern, and we are all very concerned. Uh, this sounds very nice, but uh, of course there's some background to this. So they have, in the summary of this uh, IPCC report from 2018, uh, they have five reasons for concern. That's one is unique and threatened systems, uh, like coral, corals, extreme weather events, and you can see that does, does make quite a difference from now and going to warmer temperatures. Up here we have the two degrees, so you can see between 1.5 degrees and two degrees, that does make quite a difference. Uh, distribution of impacts, that's actually, um, basically the, this means that those who suffer most have contributed less. And that's, of course, bad because those who contributed most well, don't suffer as much, and then they won't change. And that's a problem. That's, uh, that's why they're concerned on this one. Global aggregate impacts is uh, basically a money impact, so how much does this cost in the end uh, uh, to, to cope with the outcome of this? And, uh, well, it costs billions of, of uh, dollars in the end to have a difference between uh, 1.5 and 2 degrees every year just to cope with the impacts. And then we have large-scale singular events that could be something like, like de-icing of Greenland or something like that. Uh, well, when it's gone, it's just a singular event because then it's gone. Uh, this is very abstract. So they get a bit closer to that. So warm water corals is basically, uh, they're having already a problem. Um, well, I will show this later. Well, they expect about 90% will die off at 1.5 degrees. Well, they will die out at 2 degrees, most likely certain. And this is, uh, of course, this is a, uh, uh, well, it's important for nourishment and the, for people who live from the sea from whatever they fish out of the sea, because in corals there's a lot of, it's like the um, childhood bed of a lot of fish. So they have a, quite a, we do get in quite an impact in the end of fish, in, on fishery. Uh, this is why this is so red. 
Mangroves also get an, an impact on that. There's about the same story, so a lot of small fish grow up there. Uh, well, the Arctic region is getting increasing problems with the ice. Um, well, these are all kind. I will go into this later. Uh, coastal flooding will increase from 1.5 to 2 degrees. Uh, this is, uh, well, flooding in rivers and so on. Well, and we will get some more heat-related morbidity. Now, there's been a new report this year on, uh, on, on land use. Um, and this has been even more into this now different scale. Please watch that. So, oh, oh where am I here? So the scale here is uh, is going up to five degrees. And if you uh, look for that, uh, it, yeah, so it, it's a bit different. So the lower ones, 1.5 and 2 degrees, are in there. But problems they see is a dry land scarcity uh, um, and water scarcity in dry lands. Uh, so that's desertification, a lot of that. Soil erosion, which is related to that. Um, vegetation loss is also related to that. Vegetation loss is, yeah, I, I will come to this later. Um, the wildfire damage, we can see that already today, uh, I mean, in the news, every, <laughs> like, now it's Australia and Chile, but uh, before it was, uh, uh, was more California and so on, so uh, this will go on. This is no coincidence that this is happening. We have permafrost degradation. Um, we have uh, tropical crop yield decline. Well, crop yield is, of course, that hurts because well, this leads, of course, in the end to food instabilities. And we can see it does make quite a difference already between 1.5 and 2 degrees, but of course it can get worse. And they also, they are more specific on that, uh, what they mean with this. For example, in wildfire damage, uh, they have expect an increase in fire uh, in weather season currently, over 50% increase in the Mediterranean area if it gets above 2 degrees. And, uh, well, if we go to four or five degrees, this will they expect, well, hundreds of millions at least, or over 100 million people additionally exposed. Uh, in terms of food supply instabilities, well, that what we already see is, uh, well, we have like um, spikes in the food price. This is not so important for us usually. But of course, for people in the world that don't have much money, and we still have, uh, uh, almost, it's not quite one billion, uh, billion people in the world that live off less than two dollars a day. Um, for such people, this is of course quite important. Um, if we go closer to two degrees, they do expect periodic food shocks across regions. So basically that there will be situations where there will be no food available anymore. If we go up to four or five degrees, this would lead to sustained food, uh, uh, food uh, supply distribution um, problems on a global scale. So, this depends on of what kind of scenario we are calculating. Uh, I will go into this later. One additional thing is also to think of um, on, uh, um, that we are not only talking about the temperature. Um, also, the water of the oceans take up the CO2. They take up a lot of the CO2 that we blow into the air. And this leads to an acidification. And so the, um, the, the pH value of the oceans, um, they decrease. And this has an impact of a, on a lot of animals uh, that build up uh, calcium carbonate. Uh, so shells, basically. So all kinds of bivalves, all kinds of like cancers and all that, um, they depend on building up this uh, calcium carbonate. And if they are not able to do this anymore, of course they don't grow anymore. And they are pretty much in the beginning of a food supply, a food chain in the oceans. Now, um, now I was reading this 2018 report, and somewhere there on page 223. I found them this here, where they basically say, okay, we do have this impact and uh, there is this uh, aragonite um, saturation, which is, um, well, basically that's a point 
where this build-up uh, for a specific um, um, animals is not possible anymore, at this saturation point, because uh, the, the chemical reaction does not work anymore. And this depends on the temperature, this depends on the pressure, and the higher the pressure is, the earlier this point is reached, also the colder the temperature is. And so we, this is what you can see here on the right-hand side. They uh, investigated this mainly from the pole regions on, and um, so that they, this point where this, uh, this, well, this point is reach, will reach the surface of the ocean from 2030 onwards, so that there, all these animals on the surface of the ocean are not building in the polar regions, will have problems build to build up actually their shells in. This has two different impacts. Of course, one impact is if they don't grow anymore. Uh, this has a big issue on, on the food, food chain in the oceans. The second impact is actually that these, uh, this is, was a, one of the carbon sinks. They took CO2 and with calcium they build up these shells and they, they die off at some point and this is, they sink to the ground and, well, the CO2 is gone. Well, this, if this is not happening anymore, of course, the carbon sink, this type of carbon sink does not work anymore. Okay, now I've, see, I've talked a lot, these are further, I will, I will go skip through this quickly, these are all kinds of things that happen, and they, so in this 1.5 uh, degree report, they compared for a lot of regions what will happen, um, so for 1.5 degree warming or less, of 1.5 to 2 degrees and 2 to 3 degrees. Um, so, and there's all kinds of things. This is a big table in this uh, report in chapter 3. Read these reports, please. Read these reports. They're good. Uh, and they're actually scientifically good. I mean, it's in terms of if you do, it, if you do science, it's really, really good. Um, because they have so, many, so much literature and so many cross-references and how they do it to be very sure to say, okay, this is what we can say with this certainty. This is very, very good science, I think, at least. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I will not go into all, this, uh, all of this, but it has to all kinds of regions severe impacts, like South, South East Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, for example. Uh, uh, they have, you know, this risk of increased flooding and they have increased precipitation events, and yes, and, well, the, I think the most significant of this is the significant risk of crop yield reductions, which is avoided if we stay below 1.5 degrees. If we're not staying below 1.5 degrees, decrease, they say here, they estimate one-third decline in per capita per crop, uh, crop per production per year. One-third less food. That's not good. And if we go even higher, well, this is getting worse. For small islands, um, where there is actually the small islands are well known, of course, you know, they, the sea level is rising, so they have a problem. And uh, actually the main problem they have is not that just the water is going over the island, but that the, the salty water is rising and is in, uh, intruding the fresh water reserves they have. So they get a problem with fresh water. And, well, this is already a problem for them for 1.5 degrees. For 2 degrees, it's like a very severe problem. And that's why they are push pushing so much for the 1.5 degree change maximum. In the Mediterranean, this is very close to where we are currently. Uh, um, so they expect a reduction of runoff water, so this is in rivers. Uh, of about 9% is very likely, well, there's a range given, um, as most of the time they have this. Um, so there is already a risk of water deficit at 1.5 degrees increase in temperature. If we increase further, we reach about, uh, to up to 2 degrees, we have about 17% less water in the rivers. This is, of course, uh, not good. I mean, I mean, <laughs> especially, I mean, uh, okay, in Germany, for example, there's a lot of food coming from Spain, and, uh, well, uh, they do already have a problem with, uh, for the, uh, with their crops, 
with water for the crops. And this is getting worse. Uh, West Africa and Sahel, well, there is the prediction, well, where there is the prediction of, well, less suitable land for maize production by 1.5 degrees already, by 40% uh, less land. 40%, that's a lot. It's not the region where people already have a huge surplus in, in, in food every day. So um, there is an increase in risk for undernutrition already for 1.5 degrees aim. If we increase, well, the, 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 this is just getting absurd in a way. It says higher risk for undernutrition, of course, because it's going to get worse. Apart from this, that it's too hot to go outside anyways. Um, well, for southern Africa, it's similar. It's not, not as drastic, so there is already the high risk for undernutrition in communities dependent on dry land especially, so savanna areas with, which are rather dry. Um, and this is getting worse again. Well, in the tropics also, there is a risk to tropical crop yields. We already heard that. And the other si on the other side, it's also there these extreme heat waves they're going to face. So this, is, this, is like, this was like a table in there uh, with a lot of well, details of what's, what they expect from 1.5 to 2 degrees. Now, what scientists, scientists are a bit strange sometimes because they are also then doing their science and they uh, look at different things. And one thing they are actually now worried about, and this is actually, it is worrisome, very worrisome, is that actually, um, well, climate change has been always there because there has been like a cycle and this is the so-called glacial inter, uh, interglacial cycle, uh, the Earth has been going through. This has to do with the position to the sun and uh, a lot of feedback systems that kick in. If you cool the Earth, you have more ice build up, then you have more sun being reflected again, you have less energy that stays on the surface of the, eye, uh, of the Earth and then it gets colder and colder and colder up to a certain point where this changes again and goes back. And this has been going on for hundreds of years and uh, the point is now we've left the cycle. Uh, and this is the, uh, the part that's shown up here, that basically we are now on a completely different trajectory. And that's the trajectory that is we are heating this up, and the Earth is responding and it's also heating itself up. And so we've, we are on a path, and it's not quite clear, so they build this, they show this, this, this graph here, there is actually the possibility that the Earth will go on this path to heat itself up without us even. And that, that's called tipping points. So there are several things that happen there. That is, for example, the melting or thawing of the permafrost. Uh, there is uh, methane hydrates uh, in the ocean stored that might be uh, triggered to evolve. Um, there will be an, a reduction of CO2 intake in the oceans. Uh, currently, a lot of CO2 is taken into the oceans, but this will get less and less the more saturation comes in there. Um, uh, we have of a die-off of rainforests. So, well, last summer we've seen that have there a lot of rainforest burning in the Amazons, but this will also happen by the increase of temperature without human impact. And in this paper here by Stefan and uh, some others, they said they estimate if about a rainforest reduction of 40, up to 40% um, by an increase of, um, of um, up to 1.5 degrees anyways. So we're going to lose rainforest, a lot of rainforest already like that. We have a die-off in the boreal forest. This was the summer in Siberia. Well, they just don't die off, they just they get burned and there are other reasons why they die. And uh, so there's a lot of CO2 going to be emitted from forests that are where carbon is stored currently into the atmosphere. 
We have a reduction of ice and snow, so there's a more reflection of the sun, uh, less reflection of the sun into the atmosphere again, and we have a reduction of ice volume, so we have an increase in sea level. And this whole thing, uh, this is like a communicating system. Uh, and one thing triggered will trigger something else. This is sometimes goes by, by uh, the uh, so by circulations, by, but also by, by ocean circulations and so on. So one thing can trigger the next thing and this will tr might trigger the next thing and this will go on. And if this happens at a certain time, uh, at a certain intensity, then we will not have as human beings with the current current uh, technology, technology we have, we will not be able to stop that. And that's what they are worried about, so this climate scientists, that we should not get these tipping points to go too strong. They are already, this, this is already, these are processes that can be already seen, but, um, well, currently they are on a level where it's, uh, well, it's bad. There was actually four weeks ago this paper published in Nature Climate Change uh, where they said, well, we might be wrong with our estimation here with this 100 gigatons because uh, these tipping points are worse than we thought. So we are actually further there, more on the upper limits of the bounds where we thought it would be. Um, yes, so uh, these are very worrisome uh, well, situations. Now, this should trigger us to do something about it, and um, that's actually the point. So, things need to be done, but up to now, well, things have not been done. But uh, this is like the, the climate, uh, uh, climate greenhouse gas emissions curves from 1970 to 2010, and we can see that not only the, uh, the curve has been increasing, more or less the whole period, but also the increase has increased from 2000 on. <laughs> and the main increase here is by CO2. The other gases here is methane, there's uh, uh, anti, uh, and, uh, car, uh, nitrogen, <laughs> nitrogen gases up here, and uh, well, there's CO2 from, well, agriculture, forestry, and land use. This is here. They are more or less constant. Sometimes there are spikes like this. Most likely this, uh, this is like rainforest burning. The only, the only year in the recent years where there has been a decrease also in the CO2 emissions was in the uh, uh, economic crisis in 2008, where there actually was a decrease by 4%. Uh, Now, nevertheless, the scientists went on and said, OK, let's calculate. How can we man manage to get to 1.5 degrees? And there are different scenarios. Uh, some say, OK, let's go to get to 1.5 degrees. Some say, OK, maybe we need to get higher to a higher temperature and later on change that again to get to 1.5 degrees. So there are all kinds of scenarios that you can calculate. Now, if we say we use this is CDR, I will go this uh, carbon dioxide removal. We don't have that. Uh, and we say we use an exponential curve. Each year we reduce this, the same percentage of our emissions. And we want to get to 1.5 degrees. And this was uh, uh, the curve from 2018. And 2000, uh, so we should have started this year to reduce our CO2 emission by 18% each year globally, 18%, if we want to reach 1.5 degrees. If we want to be, reach 2 degrees, it's still 5% each year. 5%. 
if we do this for Germany, we, by this, and I think this is the most important figure, it's not as important, like politicians always say, oh yeah, by this year we want to uh, reduce our emissions by 50% or something like that. But this does not tell you what happens like by 2030, what happens until 2030, right? So it's very important to keep in mind that it's like we have a budget. And this is actually from a paper, it's Global Carbon Budget. They, uh, so they publish each year how much budget do we have left to, uh, uh, to emit. And so if we take this budget and say, okay, this is our budget, how are we gonna spend to spend, going to spend our carbon budget? And this is something that we should ask all the politicians. What do you think is your budget? Why do you think this is your budget? And there's been a, um, actually uh, an article by, um, uh, by climate scientist uh, Stefan Ramsdorf in the Spiegel, where he said, okay, let's estimate we have more than seven point, about 7.3 gigatons CO2 overall budget in Germany. And we could say if we want to reach 1.5 degrees, this would mean we continue our share of emissions, which would be the, in Germany, which is like double the average of the rest of the world. And we say, okay, we have the right to blow out in the air twice as much as the average person in the world. Then we still would have 1.5 gigaton CO2 in Germany to emit. And how are we gonna do that? That's the question. Are we, do we have this in mind? Of course, we can calculate this down to each person in Germany. Uh, so we end up with about 40 tons per person. So each of us can also think of this, I have 40, uh, 90 tons here, sorry, 90 tons that is to emit, uh, how I, am I gonna spend this until the end of my life? Now, um, if we go back to this report, um, then we have uh, different scenarios, and uh, as you can see, there are different ways of doing that, uh, and these are different economic scenarios. So, and you can see already that most of these scenarios do have negative emission at some points. Uh, actually, all of them have. Some of them include uh, carbon capture and storage, here as shown as BECs. Uh, and depending on what kind of economic scenario you go for, uh, this is more or less. And here it's like up to ab about 20 gigatons per year to be stored in the ground. The green part here, uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, and land use, and other land use, uh, this also, of course, you can reduce CO2 by planting trees. This is actually a very efficient way of doing that, but of course, the land, land area is limited, and this is also true for other things, uh, and of course, the land area we can use is decreasing due to climate change. We could always, should always keep this in mind. Now, the base of all these scenarios, they put this again into a table and I put, and I put some pictures to that. So they said, if we want to reach to 1.5 degrees, what we have to do, we need to rapid and profound near-term decarbonization of our energy supply. So basically, we have to be very, very quick and change our energy supply. This has to be... That's the first part. The second part, uh, we need greater mitigation efforts on the demand side, so we have to use less and get smaller with things. Third part is, well, we do have to do this within the next 10 years. So we cannot wait. This is very, very urgent. Well, this is actually a table that looks like this a bit, sorry for that. So the main thing is that the additional reductions come from CO2 emissions because uh, the um, uh, other greenhouse ga house gases are already included in the two degree scenarios. Um, we need to invest differently. So investment patterns have to change strongly. Um, what we also, the, the best options actually for 1.5 degree scenarios are the ones that go with the sustainable uh, development. Because if people don't have 
food to eat, they don't have the chance to take care of the climate anymore because first they're trying to survive. So we do have to also care about how people can live on this planet. This helps protecting the climate. Well, then they say, okay, we probably have to think of climate, uh, the carbon dioxide removal somehow at the mid of, mid of the century, uh, towards the mid of the century, so this has to be implemented now. And what we also have to do is we have to switch from fossil fuels to electricity and the end use of sector. Now, CDR, carbon dioxide removal, I will say a bit about that. Um, this is, of course, agriculture, forestry, and land use. Um, uh, that's very easy, planting trees. Then there's uh, BECS, so you use bi basically biomass uh, to produ produce some, some gas. And then you capture the CO2 from burning the gas and press this into ground in carbon capture and storage. Or what you can also do is use direct air capture, as where you use, these are like these machines. Um, so they uh, take CO2 from the air, and then you have to store it. And you can see it's such a machine here. This was like a, um, a model um, at the time. So these, are, these have been already existing models. This, uh, so basically, this can be take 1,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, so if we want to go for gigatons, uh, then we would have to build millions of these in the end. Um, the problem with that, with that is a bit in discussed also in this report. So, um, so basically, so we have an energy uh, usage of that by 12.9 uh, gigajoules per ton CO2. So basically, if we want to use uh, uh, put down 15 tons of uh, 15 gigatons of CO2 per year by this, which was in one of the scenarios, we would need about one fourth of the global energy supply only for uh, atmospheric waste management. It's called like this. And the funny thing, this was like a professor, we had them at our university here uh, in Oldenburg, and he, he gave this presentation, he said, yeah, this sounds so crazy, but the climate change will hurt you so much, this will be done. Yeah. Uh, and and Bex, that's a different way of doing that with a biogas. So the, the thing is, uh, if we want to have that at large scale, it requires huge amounts of land use to produce this amount of biogas. And um, the other drawback is, of course, that you do have to take care of your storage systems uh, to avoid the gas to come out because, well, CO2 is... Hard, uh, uh, is um, has a higher density than, uh, than oxygen, and it goes so it stays on the ground if there's no wind. And if people live there, you don't have anything to breathe anymore. Now, there are, of course, different sectors. Um, this is for the EU, for example, where, where the greenhouse gases come from. So the main parts are, of course, agriculture. Uh, there's uh, transport and... Um, the energy industry, and there's, but there's also other industries. And it's important to keep in mind that this is not equal over all different countries, but it's also distributed uh, to uh, dependent strongly on, on the income of the people in the countries. So the high, so-called high-income countries here, they have the highest share in the uh, CO2 emissions, while the mid, so so-called emerging countries. Uh, they're almost at the same level now, um, while low-income countries, they mainly have a, a CO2 emissions here from agriculture and land use. So the question is, can we make it to 1.5 degrees? That's a good question. So there have been a lot of studies, uh, uh, like, uh, like for Germany and the EU, um, either on uh, like energy infrastructure, for example, or uh, the whole system, um, there was one study from this year, um, they looked for 95% uh, CO2 reduction by 2050. 
Um, there was one study currently just uh, released uh, for the complete EU and greenhouse gas neutral EU by 2050. And um, so obviously, technically, there is this assumption that this is possible. One main thing of that is uh, that we have to go far more efficient. And one thing in that is use electricity, because electricity is very efficient in many things. So currently, the prime, currently prime energy consumption in Germany is about 2, uh, 3,200 terawatt hours in total. And the assumption for 2050, where they have this 100% or 95% uh, uh, um, uh, reduction, uh, would be 1,300 terawatt hours, or by uh, the other study was even less than that. That depends a bit on the mixture they use. Um, the reason for that is, for example, uh, that the efficiency, for example, of battery-driven cars is much higher than the one, than those of combustion-driven or other methods. So it really depends on which technology you put into use on how good you get. On the EU level, uh, the, it looks a bit like this. So uh, this is their demand and supply today. And this would be, so the reduction is not quite as large, um, but uh, there would be, they still assume that we can reach this type of reduction um, if we want to. Nevertheless, they're not assuming 100% uh, CO2 free. Um, but they calculate with uh, negative emissions by uh, agriculture and forestry. So this is actually in these calculations, and I, I really like the one by Rubinius and so on. That's the lower one because they actually calculated completely with um, storage systems, with uh, electricity grids and all that, and how much needs to be invested into this. This is a very detailed study, very, uh, very good one. So this is actually technically possible. And they even calculated this, uh, what happens in the so-called Dunkelflaute, that's a German word for there's no wind and no sun in the winter uh, for a period of time. And what happens, and this can actually, and that's what all they assume, is that we, we do have a lot of storages for gas, and we can use these current strategic storages for gas in the future to store power to, to gas, gas, so gas that's won by electricity uh, there as a backup. Um, so basically, technically, this is possible. So to conclude, so the climate system is already at a cr critical stage. The pros prospect for a 1.5 degree warmer Earth are already very bitter. And um, well, the IPCC reports and all the reports there, there are, they, all of them go for if you we should not exceed two degrees because we have this thing of the tipping, tipping points. Um, and several reasons we already have these two degrees. Yeah, this carbon uh, dioxide removal is presented, basically this is hard to avoid, but there are these critical things con concerning carbon capture and storage. And whatever we need to do is we have to act fast. And that's the main thing. This has to be done very quickly. And I must say, I'm, I'm very sorry, but our government... <laughs> well, um, yes. <clears throat> yeah. So, it is not a technical issue, it is a political one. Yes, thank you. Bernard, thank you very much. We do have eight minutes for questions. So we have a couple of microphones here in the hall. Please line up over there. We have those eight minutes. I'm sure there will be questions. Um, the signal angel is signaling over there that we have a question from the internet. Do you see uh, nuclear power plants as a temporary solution to slow the emission of CO2? Uh, and we had quite some discussion in the internet. Uh, there was uh, another one answered, you need more than 10 years to build new nuclear power plants. And the response was, well, you could re 
get the shutdown ones back on the power line. So is that a realistic scenario in your view? Well, there is actually, uh, this, this is a current discussion going on, and the, the issue with that is it's not that easy to, sh uh, to get old power plants back into running because, uh, well, they have a certain type of lifetime, and if you want to put them back on into the, into the system, then you somehow would have to exceed the lifetime. And that are some, of course, some uh, security issues, and if you want to avoid them, then you have to put a lot of money and effort into r getting them to run, and you need also a lot of time to do that. And so this, the question is, would this be worth it? And I would say probably there are faster methods to do it. Um, you could do it. There are, of course, the risks. And uh, I mean, after Fukushima and, and Chernobyl, basically, we, we've all seen what the risks are. Um, so, um, and I would say it's probably not the best and fastest way to do it. There are other ways that could be worth doing it. Okay, then we're going to hop over to microphone number one. Um, yeah, first I want to thank you for your talk. It was very informative. Um, and yeah, my question is as follows. Um, there was a talk uh, at the university where I studied in Darmstadt one and a half years ago from a person who compared the IPCC predictions with what really happened with the real temperature increase and the damage which causes the climate change. And what she found out that the IPCC always, nearly always, underestimated the effect of the temperature increase and what it causes. Um, have you ever heard of this criticism and do you think this is still the case? I hope not. Um, <laughs> the issue is, of course, that the IPCC reports is always very, very carefully taking uh, uh, decisions and uh, is very carefully looking at this and uh, they are more conservative and rather are lower than the, uh, than the actual temperatures in the end, probably, because there is, of course, also a lot of pressure, political pressure on them. And uh, so if they would predict something and they would over-predict, then people would immediately say, come and say, hey, you're doing panicking and so on. And uh, so that's why it is most likely that they try to be as accurate as possible but they rather choose the lower, um, the, uh, the lower estimates. Yeah, that what was uh, she was saying as well. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a, it's a very it's a, I mean in the end it's a, a, this uh, summary for policymakers. I showed some slides from that. Uh, that is actually voted on by the by governmental um, agents. Um, so they bring this into a governmental uh, round of the UN. They are a UN. Um, entity, and so, and the, the governments actually say, uh, have to approve this. And so, uh, that's why it's very, very diplomatic and in the terms of, so they're re doing reasons for concern, you know. So it's, uh, I mean, uh, people are concerned about all kinds of things. Thanks. <laughs> all right, then we hop over to microphone two, please. Okay, first, uh, thank you for your talk. All good mood is gone now. And, uh, if it's mainly a political problem, um, do you have any idea how we can force politicians to make the right decisions now? Because what we are doing at the moment, like protesting and uh, voting, doesn't seem to work. Well, I, I, th <laughs> I, I think... <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm very happy because I think protesting works. But it does not work in the same way that people who usually take it to the streets think it works. It puts a lot of pressure onto them, but it's one pressure on, they also have pressure from other sides, you know, and then they look at, you know, what are the, my voters, and if their voters are not the ones that are on the streets, well, they might be not as important. And so, uh, I think the main thing is, that needs to be done, is to go out to the people, and this, going to the street is one way of doing that, and tell the, uh, you know, and talk to the people and talk especially to those who are not there on the streets yet, who are the potential voters of those who think, well, I don't have to care so much about because these are not my voters. 
And we just have to go out and talk. And I think this will put up the pressure together with taking it to the streets and protesting and doing whatever, talking to politicians. And I mean, we have a, you know, Angela Merkel is our, our chancellor in Germany, and she's a physicist. I mean, she knows. I mean, this is, she understands all this. You know, it's not that she doesn't know. It's just the pressure from the wrong side yet. All right, and we have time for one last question. Microphone three, please. Yes, thank you also very much from my side for the informative talk. Um, from the description of the talk, I was expecting more on the, it said something about the resilience, about climate skepticism, yeah. uh, to be more resilient about their arguments. And um, I was in discussion with many other people, also climate skepticists, and what they sometimes said, they didn't um, criticize the anthropogenic, well, they didn't criticize the climate change at all, but the anthropogenic part of it, and what they say, that there is like an increase of solar activity the last decades, uh, which increases to the temperature, and that also, um, like the diagram is like only from 1860, but if you consider like the last millennials, there have been higher uh, values of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the temperature did not correlate. So how do you argue with this, these uh, kind of arguments? Yes, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, go into these because they are the, sometimes the easy ones. Um, uh, but uh, the thing is... Um, that um, there are, I, I did, did this talk this way because uh, it helps, uh, if, if you go into, our oh, climate skeptics say this, and they say a lot of different things. I, I could do a whole talk on what climate skeptics say. Uh, if you do that, um, then in the end, people keep in mind, uh, oh yeah, this, uh, there is some skepticism on this. And uh, this is, I, I did a lot of these things because uh, by this now people can go out and say, okay, this is currently the state of the, of the research. Um, I did not go into the climate skeptic detailed answers. Of course, there are, I mean, I can, like, for example, sun radiation is already in the climate models, uh, the, the changes in sun radiations. The variations of, the, uh, of centuries before are actually being pre-calculated in the climate models currently, because only if you're able to run, if, you, if you're able to mimic that in climate models today, uh, for today, uh, or, or the past, if you're able to do that, then you're able to, do, uh, to run it for the future. And this is how climate models work. And so all, this, all these variations are taken in. So I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm old, time is old. But we can talk about this also later on. I didn't get too much to the climate skeptics now. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. We don't have time for any more questions. Bernard, that's your applause. Thank you very much.